I was talking to I was talking to somebody the other day, and we were both saying um, we were talking about woke, and we were both saying if there's one thing worse than being what publicly woke, it's being publicly unwoke. Um, you can't difficulty of steering a line between these two extremes. So I'd probably do something do something like that. Um, and wishing the word woke had never been invented because it's caused such problems on both sides. I am very interested in, um, yes, that would be my first column, the monstrousness really of any kind of censorship, um, the, the importance of allowing a free voice while at the same time knowing how, how dangerous uh, what we call free speech could be because of the, we only have to see what happens on the internet. I have nothing to do with social media, nothing whatsoever to do with it, but I never stop ranting about it. And I think it's the devil's, I think it's the devil's playground, social media. And I think one day we will, if we survive the other devils, the, the other devilry in our world, if we survive it, I think we will say, how did we ever tolerate that nonsense? How could we have let that thing loose in our life? So probably that would be my, my my first article but i have written i have written it several times now as promised howard jacobson is one of britain's greatest novelists a background in academia furnished him with many of the comic archetypes uh, that have graced his fiction most notably in his debut coming from behind which he wrote aged 40. howard's jewish heritage and upbringing are the focus of much of his work both the mighty waltzer and the booker prize winning the finkler question are rooted in wickedly observed recreation of the Jewish community. His recently released memoir, Mother's Boy, is a very tender exploration of how Howard uh, became the writer he is today, tracing back his working class upbringing in 1940s Manchester, amongst other things. He's gracing the stage to talk about the book next Tuesday at the Stratford Literary Festival. But first, he's here joining me on Times Radio. Howard, welcome. Lovely to talk to you. Um, you were a latecomer to the world of, of fiction, really, I suppose, in your 40s, though, you know, um, I don't want to be judgmental because I think more and more people should be starting to do things of interest in, in later life. But anyway, you were a latecomer to that. Would you say now at the age of, what is it, 79, that, that, that you're a bit of a latecomer? Well, let's to the... <laughs> move, move quickly over that. Let's okay. move quickly 79, over that. Uh, uh, would you say that you're a latecomer to the um, memoir? I mean, memoirs are nowadays being written by people who are kind of 18 years is old yes i am a late come i'm a late comer to everything really i started everything i i i for, for years i made the joke that i was born old um something was wrong my, all my timing has been wrong i've always been playing catch up somehow or other i'm always behind i don't know how that happened it's not as though you you made it sound as though writing a novel late when i was 40 was kind of quite a heroic thing to do as though i turned my hand to it at last. In fact, I was going round the bend wondering why I couldn't write one sooner. In my head, I'd been trying to write a novel since I was about six, maybe even sooner, and I just couldn't do it. So it was a kind of, this is partly a memoir of uh, absurdly told, as you would expect, but it's a memoir of a kind of an agony, really. I think I say somewhere in the book, can you die of not writing a novel? I did think I would die of not writing a novel. And had you actually, by the age of uh, 40, not com just not completed a novel or not got halfway through one? Or, I mean, how badly had you failed up to that point, dare I ask? Well, you couldn't... I don't know whether it's a... Is it more of a failure to write one and then to have it rejected than just not write? I just didn't write anything. No, I it's just, more of a failure to write one and have it rejected in terms of the fact that you've gone through <laughs> the, 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 the effort, haven't you? All right, in that case, I was a huge success because I didn't write anything. I couldn't write it. I was trying to write a novel that it was not in me to write. I make the joke time and time again that I wanted to sound like Henry James or Jane Austen. I wanted to write about worlds I didn't know, partly because I now realise, and that's why I wrote this book to work this out, I was running away from the world I did know. It was an act of... I paid the price for being a coward. I paid the price for being ashamed of where I came from. It's an old story, isn't it? Uh, working class, Mancunian, Jewish. I didn't want to be from the North. I didn't want to be working class. I didn't mind being Jewish, but I didn't want to make a fuss about it. So I was hiding all those things. And as a consequence of that, nothing, nothing got written. A few lectures got written, um, but no, no fiction got written, nothing. Until in the end, I was so desperate. And I was desperate because the job I had struck me as humiliating. It shouldn't have, but it did. 
uh, and I felt I'd finally ended up nowhere. I thought this was it. I am nowhere now, so I might as well write a, jo a, a novel which jokes about my being nowhere, which was not the novel I ever meant to write. But ironically, writing the novel I was never meant to write, it seemed to me, meant I wrote something, and it got written, and uh, it got accepted. So tell me uh, how much you think, you talked about your beginnings there and you talked about the fact that, that perhaps trying to distance yourself from them was one of the things that held you back from actually doing the very thing you most wanted to, which was writing uh, a book. Um, tell me a bit about those, those beginnings. Um, it sounds like, uh, I mean, I laugh when you describe those idyllic four years uh, of your life uh, when you were first born and your father was away fighting in a war and you were surrounded by women who lavished attention and love on you. Is that something that you actually remember or, or yes. you like the sound of because they've told you how much you were adored? Well, you, you discover it. very very quickly when you come to do a thing like this, you re you have to face the fact that what you are remembering is partly the time you told it last and you're remembering other people's stories. But I think I found a way back to it. And I do think I remember being three. I mean, I liked, I used to tell my mother I could remember being born. She wouldn't have, she wouldn't have any of that. But I certainly remember being about four. And I remember being in a little soldier suit, which my father made me. My father was in the army and he was working as a tailor because he was Jewish. They said, you're, a, you're, you're Jewish, you're a tailor. So he made me a little soldier suit. And I would march up and down the living room in my little soldier suit saying, so it was some song like you're in the army, Mrs. You've something about being in the army and what it's like being in the army. And I was a little soldier and they loved me. My mother and her sister and my mother's mother, they were all young women. I was born young to a young mother I think she was 19 or something and these young women adored me and it went it was absolute paradise until a snake a snake came into my garden a snake always comes into your garden that's the nature of paradisal gardens and that was my brother and at that moment they had something else to occupy their attention and it was for many years I remember this too quite a heartbreaking experience because I suddenly got less attention I wasn't ignored, I wasn't thrown out, I wasn't maltreated, I just wasn't adored in the way I had been adored when there was only me. And how much did this initial rejection, which you took very hard, quite clearly, uh, how much uh, did it influence both the person you became and the writer you became? Did it make you needy? Needy? Mm -hmm. Yes, it made me very needy and embittered and, and jealous and sarcastic and splenetic and all those things that which are, which are the heart hallmark of my style. I guess had my had a little brother not turned up in the garden at that time, I would have been a different kind of writer. I might have ended up like Henry James or, or Jane Austen and not the kind of uh, satiric and sarcastic writer I did end up. Yes, you, it did. You might I, never I, have ended up a writer at all. Or at all. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. I might have been happy. I'm just, I might have had my <laughs> own radio programme. I'm, sure I'm not sure if that necessarily makes you happy, but maybe you have to now, instead of, uh, instead of bitterly resenting your brother, actually realise that he made you everything that you are. He's told me that. <laughs> He's told me that several times. Instead of telling this story all the time, uh, just remember how much you owe me, he says. We're very good friends, I have to say. I never did do him any harm, although I wrote a novel halfway through my career about Cain and Abel because I felt I did know what, what had upset Cain quite so badly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I told that story, but I never got round to <laughs> I never got round to doing anything quite so drastic. And we are very good friends. But what I do remember is I was so frightened that something psychologically, this is interesting, I was so frightened that something would happen to him when he was little. And we shared a room the way you did in those hard times in the 40s and 50s in Manchester. We shared a room uh, and we had little beds next to each other. And at night when he'd fallen asleep, I would get, I would lean over and put my ear to his, to him, to make sure he was breathing. I was terrified that he would stop breathing, that he would die in the night. And of course, it would have been my fault. You were a bit of a worrier, but you're also a hugely sentimental person, which I think is is one of the fascinating things about you. I mean, this book is, 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 is full of tears. I, I'm sure, you did you spill tears writing it? Hmm. I did spill tears writing it, yes, quite often. Um, quite often. It was a dangerous thing for me to do because you're quite right, I am sentimental. I tried hiding it 
For years and years and years, I'd try hiding it. I would go to the pictures and blubber over any old thing, particularly musicals like Student Prince and the Desert Song and things. Uh, and I didn't dare let anybody see that I was sitting in the stalls crying. And when, when my friends would talk about crying in, in, at the pictures or when reading, I would laugh at them and jeer at them. I dreaded being known as a weeper, I dreaded it. But in fact, I am, and now I'm old enough that it doesn't matter and I can come out. But I do, I mean, I, I, I nostalgize if there's such a, a, a word, everything. My wife laughs at me and because she says, I will make a nostalgic event of yesterday. I will go, oh, do you remember that wonderful lunch we had in that Chinese restaurant? And she'd say, yes, it was yesterday. Why are you remembering everything as though it's kind of in some golden glow? And I do, I, I put the past in a golden glow, even, even some past that actually has no glow about it at all. And I'm full of dreads about the future. I'm full of, full of apprehension. Uh, about about loss um, um, and I think I've been thinking about loss maybe it's got something to do with my brother and my feeling that I did lose something at that moment I've been thinking about loss all along and although my books are not always overtly about loss more and more they have come to be about loss and when you went backwards and started looking uh, at your life perhaps more forensically and 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 and, and, and perhaps having to remove the sort of golden glint that you'd bestowed it with. Um, how difficult was that? How much did it change your assessment of who you were? And how much did you find in there that actually ended up in your books that you perhaps weren't even aware of at the time you were writing them? I don't know. I don't know whether I'm as good about kind of allowing things to creep up on me like that as I'd like to be. I have, I, I fear I might have been in a bit more control than that. And that I always say when I write a book, I don't know where I'm going and I don't know where I'm going. And I didn't know where this memoir was going either. But I can't honestly say, I'd like to be able to say, my God, that astounded me. I can't say that. It was not quite that kind of book. It was more about, these are the things that have happened. I know they have happened. And I don't want them to reveal themselves in a new way. I partly want to reveal myself in a new way in that I want to understand them and be seen understanding them and show that I understand them. And even though this sounds very corny, doesn't it? To kind of apologize in a kind of way, not, not apologize in the, oh my God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Though God knows there's a lot of that to do, but apologize in the sense of almost a religious sense of get to the bottom of it, get to know why I was like, why was I like that? And it's that kind of a book really, rather than anything else. Why was I like that? Um, and, I, and I do think it was pretty terrible that I was like that. I've lived a long life now, and I don't know whether I've done any more shocking things than most people my age have done, nothing terribly shocking, but some, some not very nice things. And I just wanted to understand why as a way of preparing, preparing myself for my maker, but preparing myself for my readers and preparing myself for me to, I wanted to feel all right at the end of this book that I hadn't let myself off. So tell me a little bit about her. Uh, I mean, I know that she introduced you to books. She introduced you to poetry. Um, was that all before you were four years old? It was, uh... Yeah, it was certainly about the time I was four, she'd read me a few poems, but I can't remember the, 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 the times in which she did that. But she did read me, she did, I recall sitting there, I see sentimentalising again, you see, I see it's kind of twilight in our house and I'm sitting on the carpet, on the floor by her feet and she's got a book open and it's probably Paul Graves' Golden Treasury of English Lyrics and she's reading poems to me and and I'm loving it. Now, if I'm more than four, where's my brother? If I'm more than six, where's my sister who was born then? But I can wipe them from this, from this passage. She's reading to me and to me only. And I, and I hear her words and her, I, I think I say in the book, I do say in the book, that she creates the music really that I go on hearing when I write, that I, went, that I, hear, I heard before I wrote, which was partly why I was so desperate to write because I had this music of this poetry from her in my head. What was wonderful about her, and it probably has taken me a long time to see it and grasp what was wonderful about her, because it's hard to do that about your mother. Um, what was wonderful about her was she was an uneducated woman. She left school when she was 14. No one gave her books. Um, I came by her diary when she died. She died while I was writing this memoir. She was 97. 
um, and she'd had she'd had a long life. Um, and then I came across her diary. My sister sent me her diary while I was writing, and in her diary, she it was a wonderful year when she's kind of seventeen and talking about her boyfriends and all that. And she's just going to the theatre all the time, and she's going to operas in Man Manchester, and she's going to the Central Reference Library and saying how much she loves the Reference Library, and then saying which I had no idea about till I read this. Uh, diary that she'd wanted to be a writer. I didn't know she'd wanted to be a writer. I know she encouraged me to be a writer. I thought she just wanted to be a reader. But it's remarkable that somebody, it might be remarkable about her, and it also rem might remind us of better days when people lived that kind of life, mm. uh, when, when it was thrilling to go to the library, when it was, she wasn't going to musicals and things when she was going to Theatre. She was going to hit Bernard Shaw and, and things like that, Terence Rattigan. She took, she was a, she educated herself and I don't know where it came from. And I was a huge beneficiary of, of this. And because the poetry that I heard when I was young came in her voice, and she had a lovely voice actually, a lovely, deep, thrilling voice. Um, and I kind of therefore associated poetry with the hearth and with affection and with love. Um, and she kind of made it sacred and literature has been sacred to me and um, might not always been clear from some of the things I've written, but I do take it. You know, it's like holy writ to me, which was why they're not writing a novel. I knew I wasn't going to be a poet, although poetry, what she read me at first, I knew I had to be a novelist. Can't fully explain that. But so that because I thought it was sacred, the not writing a novel seemed so agonizing. And because I thought it was sacred, I thought I could never do it. Mm. I thought, surely this is too grand a vacation. When I first saw myself That's... called a novelist, I was so thrilled by it. Do I deserve it? Do I deserve to be called a novelist? It was godlike. But it's not the only reason that you didn't think you could become a novelist, I imagine, because I remember listening to you tell a story about um, the, the, the Booker Prize, the, the, the year that you won the Booker Prize, and uh, you talking to your mother, and I'm not sure if you invited her along to the ceremony, but I'm sure you definitely encouraged her to watch it on television, and, and she turned you down because it was unlikely uh, that you were going to win, and, and, and she didn't want you to sort of get above yourself or, or to suffer disappointment. Was that, do, do you think that that was something that had a profound impact on your sense of yourself as well the sense that you should never expect too much because yes. if you did life would disappoint yes. you yes it wasn't about getting above myself she never did that uh, she encouraged me to be confident it was a it was a conflict really that i'm still trying to solve she encouraged me to be confident she encouraged me to believe in herself and to believe I could do anything. And yet at the same time, she was kind of dissuading me from trying because she was frightened that I would be disappointed. She and didn't want me to be disappointed. She couldn't bear it. So that, if I don't hope for too much, I can't be disappointed. And that seems to me perhaps a really big contributing factor to the delay in you launching your career as a, a, a novelist. But I have to say, we had a text from, from a gentleman called Duncan uh, and he says, Howard Jacobson taught me English Lit at college in Wolverhampton in the 70s. He was always an inspirational lecturer full of pro, uh, provocative ideas who made you think. Always worth listening to. So you were clearly very good at something else as well. Well, that's nice. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you very much. It's nice to think a memory from all that time ago. I think I, what I think I was as a teacher. I never wanted to be a teacher. A teacher is what you do when you've not written yet. Um, and a lot of writers are, well, many of them stay teachers, but I felt I had to get out. Um, but when I did teach, I was a good at conveying my enthusiasms. I, I was a good lecturer. I was a terrible one-to-one -one teacher. I couldn't bear having to read a student's essays. Why? Because you hadn't written it. Because <laughs> I it's a, it's somebody else's words. <laughs> That's cruel. That's cruel. <laughs> somebody else's words, yes. But, but I know, I know you don't like to hear your wife laughing at novels. You know, if you hear her in the other room laughing at a Philip Roth, you're absolutely, you know, incensed. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a little bit personal and intimate to laugh at a person's prose. I don't <laughs> mind her. I never minded her crying over somebody else's writing. But laughing over some other or laughing over some other man's writing. I think that's, it's a kind of infidelity, that. And it, 
and it hurt. But it's, then, it's also she's allowed. She's allowed. She can. She can read. She's allowed to read. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I'm sure she's grateful. As long as the doors close. <laughs> but it is also a territory that you've been very, um, very able to police. I dare say because there aren't very many funny literary authors. No, there aren't. There aren't. Um, uh, and. And that's why it was such a surprise, really, when a novel that was funny, not my funniest, but nonetheless, a novel that was funny, won the Booker Prize and Jewish, the two things that don't do very well with prizes in, in this country. It was amazing that it, that it did win. Novels are a problem. Uh, co sorry, co comedy and comic novels are a problem in the liter in the in, in, in English literary world because we take literature. It's not that we take it seriously. I take it seriously. No one takes the English novel more seriously than I take it. But I don't see comedy as the enemy of the serious. Comedy is a means to seriousness. Whereas, whereas there is a certain solemnity about sometimes about certainly the guardians of British culture that they don't want to laugh. And they feel that if they're laughing, they're breaking the sacred spell of literature. <laughs> and I don't like the sacred spell of literature. It's like it's the broken, church. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need to tell you, you know the literary, the literary world in England is like the church. So uh, a Mancunian Jewish writer making jokes, is, it's almost as if you are, you've entered the holy of holies and you've done something, you know, unspeakably, unspeakably unholy. You also had a, a sort of sideline, if you will, as a journalist for quite a long time. You had a, a long-standing relationship with The Independent uh, and wrote a weekly column, I think, uh, only giving it up in, in 2016. Um, how much did you enjoy uh, being involved with the arguments and debates of the day? And how relieved are you that you're no longer writing it in, in, in the world we currently live in, where actually expressing an opinion that doesn't you know, toe the toe the majority line can often be quite a kind of difficult thing to 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 cross over. Yes, it would be. Uh, I, I feel vexed. I was very glad my, when my column came to an end because I'd done it for twenty years and I felt I'd run out of things to say. And I remember I remember saying to friends, oh, "I'm really glad. There's nothing much happening in the world now. My column's over." <laughs> and then there was Brexit, and then there was Trump, and then there was and everything that's happened since. Probably the busiest period ever. I would like to be involved in it. I do do points of view for the BBC, if I may mention that, um, and I enjoy those, and they do grapple with, with these issues. I miss it. It's good for me not to be doing it because, strictly speaking, strictly speaking, a novelist shouldn't be doing all that. I am a believer that a novelist must stay out of the fray. But I enjoyed wearing another hat, and I enjoyed the fight. And actually, to be honest, when it comes to the issues of now, what people are talking about, I would really like, I wish I had an independent column now because I would go to town. I'd have fun. There are so many things that make me, that drive me around the bend at the moment. What, um, what would be your first column be about, Howard? Oh, that's too hard. It's um, not. Just think of the first thing that enrages you. That's what no, I, I usually do. <laughs> no, I, I was talking to, I was talking to somebody the other day and we were both saying, um, we were talking about woke and we were both saying, if there's one thing worse than being what publicly woke, it's being publicly unwoke. Um, you can't, difficulty of steering a line between these two extremes. So I'd probably do something, do something like that. Um, and wishing the word woke had never been invented because it's caused such problems on both sides. I am very interested in, um, yes, that would be my first column, the monstrousness really of any kind of censorship. Um, the, the importance of allowing a free voice while at the same time knowing how how dangerous uh, what we call free speech could be because of the, we only have to see what happens on the internet. I have nothing to do with social media, nothing whatsoever to do with it, but I never stop ranting about it. And I think it's the devil's, I think it's the devil's playground, social media. And I think one day we will, if we survive the other devil's, the, the other devilry in our world, if we survive it, I think we will say, how did we ever tolerate that nonsense? How could we have let that thing loose in our life? So probably that would be my, my my first article, but I have written I have written it several times. It's interesting that that you argue, uh, you know, for freedom of speech uh, and and the, and the fact that that's sacred, um, because one of the things that that you know is often censored is any kind of criticism of Israel, of Judaism, and so on. You know, that is sacrosanct because of 
particularly what happened in the Second World War. And you were very critical about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and said that trust between the party and most British Jews was fractured beyond repair. I, I wonder what you feel about that now and, and what your thoughts are on Keir Starmer's leadership, but 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 also on the, on, on the thing with, you know, the trouble with free speech is free speech is great until somebody says something that you really, really find offensive. Well, I know that, um, but there is a difference between free speech and lies. Um, and never in my argument about those things that I want any voices silenced. I never said silence Jeremy Corbyn, for example. I just said, don't vote for him. Um, I, I would not have dreamed of wanting anybody, anybody censored. But I don't think there's any contradiction really between feeling people have got a right to say what they, the, the, they think and what they believe, but they must be called to account if what, if what they believe is nonsense. If they cite as a truth that which is not a truth, um, you go in fighting, but you don't go in fighting to burn their books. You go in fighting to put them right. I have this sentiment, you say I'm a sentimentalist, I am. I have this sentimental dream that if I can just say it right, if I can say the thing right, they will all see what's wrong and come to me and say, I always dreamed Corbyn would. Howard, you know, what you've just told me about, about Israel and Zionism and what I have. And I now realize my, my, the, 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 the wrongness of my argument. And I agree with you, Howard, thank you. That's all I'm doing really. I'm just <laughs> waiting for them to say, thank you for my putting them right. But I'm not censoring. So there you are. I have to leave you still waiting for a call from Jeremy Corbyn. It's a sad truth, but the call hasn't come yet, has it? Um, Howard. it, won't, it? That's what you're telling me, it won't. Well, I can't read the man's mind, can I? But luckily I can read your book and I think that you very much did get to the heart of it. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, memoir, full of life, um, even if it was written after a very long life. Um, thank you very much, Howard Jacobson. Uh, thank you for joining me on Times Radio. Uh